Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon and welcome to Kuiper College. I am Nick Cruzy, and I have the privilege of serving as president here of this institution. And we are thrilled to be hosts for all of you who are gathered here to uh, consider, reflect on, take action on a very uh, important matter that touches all of our lives in one way or another. You know, that uh, the discussions that will be held today can in so many ways seem philosophical, and it's great to have time and opportunity to discuss such deep thoughts in a philosophical manner. But when it involves your own family members, those you love, of course, it becomes very personal and also very urgent. Uh, and so we are grateful that we can have this time together uh, to reflect from a Christian perspective on what it means to approach uh, the final moments of life, uh, both as one going through the experience as well as family or friends. Uh, we're very grateful for our panelists uh, today who are uh, able to be uh, part of the afternoon, uh, Dr. Michael Paletta, and uh, the, tried to figure out the M-A-C-Q-L, Dr. Paletta, and I, I think that it's the Maggie Alessi, Alice, Maggie Alice, thank you, uh, Center for the Quality of Life. So a uh, very important role that he has in research and development that works with that. Uh, Luann Arnson uh, is a face a person who is known well to us at Kuiper College uh, because she helps us think through the quality of our social work program here at this institution. And we thank you for being part of this from a, a perspective that includes both your professional side as well as your personal connection uh, with Kuiper College. Dr. Branson Parler, uh, with our Bible and Theology Department, uh, is a person whom we respect very highly here at Kuiper. Uh, he is a person who mm, likes to think philosophically, for sure, uh, but he also has a very practical bent about him uh, that is very important to how we carry out education here. Uh, so welcome to the three of you. Uh, we're so glad you can share this time with us. Now, the way the afternoon will unfold is that there will be three areas that are to be discussed. A presentation will be made, and then the floor will be opened for question and answer period. Uh, Dr. Paletta will be keeping track of time to allow adequate time for each of these three periods. Uh, so please anticipate that there will be a presentation, Q&A, followed by a second presentation, Q&A, and then a third presentation and Q&A. And they will try hard to get to all of your questions. Panelists, is there anything else that I can serve you with by announcing? We're good to go? Uh, yes, please do that, all right, if you would with your questions. Indeed, we have a microphone also on the other side of the auditorium. Uh, so with that, I give you our free presentation. Thank you. My, my name is Mike Paletta, and I'm grateful to uh, Kuiper College and Hospice of Michigan uh, for the opportunity to come and spend some time with you this afternoon uh, dealing with issues that the three of us deal with routinely, but which uh, some of you may or may not deal with on a regular basis, but certainly uh, all of you in your personal lives, friends, family members, or in the course of your work, may have occasion to, uh, to visit these issues. So. I will share with you case one, uh, after which I'll make a few comments from a medical or physician uh, point of view. A man who identified himself as a Christian was receiving hospice care at his residence in a nursing facility. The symptoms of his illness included diminished appetite, and as time went on, he was taking less and less food and fluid by mouth. The hospice team had, as its first priority, the use of medications to diminish any suffering that would result from this. And these measures were effective in the opinion of both the hospice and the facility staff. One day, the hospice team received a phone call from an anonymous person accusing the hospice of, quote, starving the patient to death, unquote, and demanding that intravenous fluids and a feeding tube be placed immediately to satisfy a religious request that all gravely ill persons receive artificial nutrition and hydration. 
the caller further threatened to mobilize protesters and media coverage if the hospice and the facility did not comply. Now, as it turned out, the man died shortly after the call was made. The protest did not materialize, and the caller was never identified. But this case does illustrate uh, a number of myths and misconceptions from a medical standpoint about end-of-life care uh, that I'll uh, deal with in, in uh, several statements. Uh, and then my colleagues will weigh in, and then we'll have your questions. Uh, the first is that a choice of hospice by a patient or a patient and their family implies an acceptance of the prognosis. Patients are referred to hospice when the end of their life is foreseeable as a consequence of advancing illness. And people who sign on to hospice or their family members, if they're acting as a proxy, they know that that's the story. So people are not put on hospice in a cavalier way or put on without evidence of advancing disease where the end of that life is foreseeable. So, so that's thing one. Secondly is that artificial nutrition and hydration are medical procedures. And as such, they are ethically neutral. They're not good and they're not bad in and of themselves. There are situations where artificial nutrition and hydration are absolutely the correct intervention to diminish suffering. But I must tell you that there are other situations where artificial nutrition and hydration are not only not helpful, but harmful, and therefore should be avoided or discontinued. But from an ethical standpoint, they are neutral. They're medical procedures to be considered and used appropriately. Another point that I'd like to share is that the plan of care for a hospice patient should be determined by knowledgeable people informed by the stated wishes or the written wishes of the patient and the family. So again, it's not, these are not arbitrary decisions. These are not cookbook solutions. These are plans of care that are put in place after the hospice team has had an opportunity to talk to the patient, talk to the family and, and interested persons, understand what that individual wants for themselves or what they don't want for themselves as part of their end of life care. And that's where these orders and these uh, medical treatments come from. I should also point out that dying persons do not starve to death. That language is unnecessarily inflammatory and if we're gonna be intellectually honest about what happens to a human being when they are hours or days or even a number of days from death, starve to death is not useful language. As a natural consequence of advancing illness, people's systems shut down. And actually the design engineer on the human body was a pretty smart fella. Because when we're really gravely ill and our bodies cannot metabolize nutrients in the way that it did when we were healthy, that hunger switch in our brain goes to the off position. And people don't want to eat when they're gravely ill. And in fact, forcing them to eat sometimes causes very distressing symptoms. But either way, they're not starving to death. And for someone uh, with an agenda to use that language doesn't help the situation. Among the advantages of hospice care is that partnership that I have already mentioned about. People who know the patient and their values and what they've wanted for themselves and don't want, and the technical and medical, the, the nursing, the social workers, the, uh, the aides, the volunteers, the whole team that knows how to do this work and does it every day, that partnership to plan an approach and a, uh, craft a plan of care that will uh, take both the medical, the spiritual, and the uh, ethical considerations into account, that's what you get with a hospice team at the end of life. And for someone, as in our case, on the outside to interpose themselves into that mix 
um, is not desirable and, and certainly would not lead to a, a positive outcome. And then the last comment I'll make uh, before uh, my colleagues add their remarks is that this idea of using artificial hydration or, and or nutrition to keep someone alive longer if the effect is to prolong the dying process, then that would be a cruel outcome. Certainly not heroic, and certainly not something that ought to be pursued. And so this idea that if we just continue to pump people full of fluids and nutrients that they will somehow stay alive uh, is a misconception that's common uh, in non-medical people. And that idea that, well, if nutrition stops and the hydration stops, the person will die, it may be that the person dies, but they're dying from the advanced disease. They're dying from the illness they have. They're not dying because somebody dialed down the IV or stopped the tube feed or failed to start those interventions in the first place. So this idea of prolonging the dying uh, by using artificial means is something that we avoid doing. Um, and we use nutrition and hydration as tools to diminish suffering where we see that that's appropriate uh, but otherwise they they have very limited use in end-of-life care so I'll end my comments there and uh, turn over to my colleagues for their individual perspectives uh, I think this uh, this case presents uh, a number of things to think through uh, Christian ethicists recognize that uh, intentionally uh, ending someone's life is an expression of human arrogance. Uh, that, that that is not allowable and acceptable. But I think what we sometimes don't always acknowledge uh, is that artificially prolonging life uh, may also be an expression of arrogance. Uh, that this is what uh, ethicists talk about as vitalism. This is the idea that uh, we need to use every means possible in all circumstances to ward off death. Uh, that the mere presence of a heartbeat or respiration or brain activity uh, is compelling reason to do everything possible to save the patient's life. Uh, and that, I think, uh, is a temptation. The sanctity of life can easily morph into idolatry so that we recognize uh, life is a great good but it's not an absolute good. Uh, it's not an ultimate good. There are uh, more important things. Uh, and sometimes I wonder if uh, the way we approach medicine uh, as, as Christians on uh, kind of a popular level uh, almost gives medicine too much power, that medicine can master death. Medicine cannot master death. Uh, medicine can be a ministry of grace but it cannot master death. And so if Christians approach medicine in that way, uh, I think that's a problem. From the Christian perspective, uh, death is certainly an enemy. Scripture talks about death in this way. Uh, but it is a defeated enemy. And vitalism uh, can, in many ways, actually be too afraid of death. That it can actually express a fear of death that Christians should not, in fact, have. Uh, Hebrews 2.15 talks about the fact that Christ has set us free from slavery. What is that slavery? The slavery is fear of death. Uh, and so I think it's worth asking, uh, as, as Christians, as we ponder some of these issues, uh, do our medical practices, do, does how we think about end-of-life issues uh, suggest that God or death is more powerful? And clinging to life in this kind of absolute way may actually give death the upper hand rather than God. Uh, and so in this particular case, uh, I think making that distinction and, and thinking through, through uh, those things are important. Uh, a couple of other distinctions, and these, again, are distinctions that I think will recur in other cases. As Dr. Paletta has, has mentioned, there is a distinction between preserving life and prolonging death. And I'm a philosopher, so I love distinctions. So uh, just, just give me more distinctions all the time. Uh, but that's very crucial, prolonging life, or, or preserving life versus prolonging death. Uh, the distinction between euthanasia and allowing to die. Uh, 
Uh, and oftentimes, again, if we're not very uh, careful and subtle in our thinking, uh, we say, well, you know, the end result here is the same. Uh, people are going to die. Uh, but they are radically different in terms uh, of moral significance and intention. We have to acknowledge that. We have to be careful enough and critical enough in our, in our thinking. Uh, another distinction that is helpful is ordinary versus extraordinary means to preserve someone's life. Or another way of saying it is proportionate versus disproportionate means. And in order to assess this, you do have to look at each individual case. Uh, and I think especially in this case, part of, uh, part of what we're saying uh, is that the prognosis for this patient is that this is not, in the end, going to result in preserving life. And so it would be disproportionate uh, to utilize these means simply to uh, prolong someone's death in that case. Uh, and so from the perspective uh, of Christian ethics, I think there are good reasons uh, to affirm uh, that oftentimes letting go of someone in that position uh, is, in fact, the proper response rather than trying to uh, cling to life at all costs. The first thing that I think of um, as a social worker is that um, I'm making a basic assumption that this gentleman um, sort of exercised his right for self-determination by um, signing himself onto hospice care. And um, that's an ethical and a value a statement and one that he himself exercised the um, good decision-making and um, informed consent to go ahead and to um, receive this type of treatment. I um, immediately wondered why uh, someone would call, and um, I'm thinking of in terms of confidentiality. Uh, again, one of the ethics and values of um, social work practice in that um, I'm thinking, gosh, I hope they didn't admit that he was even a patient there um, because that's one of the things that we often do is we will not disclose whether or not someone is in fact living there. Um, I looked at, you know, the background and the thinking about this person's um, autonomy, the respect for this individual to make that very difficult decision to seek hospice care and to to have the respect for this gentleman to be able to die um, with, with respect and dignity. I also thought about um, the social work component of this as a social worker, and I thought about a really great assessment, and this would be the time for you not to slouch, um, but to do a very good assessment, a psychosocial, biopsychosocial, spiritual assessment of this individual his family, his preferences, how he chose to die, how he chose to live out his last days, um, what his faith practices are, looking at issues of potentially some spiritual distress that might be occurring in him. Um, how, how is he choosing to say goodbye to his family? Are they allowed in the room 24 seven with him? And the other thing, the realistic thing that I thought of too, is that when a person gets a call like this, the team really rallies. We start to look at um, looking over our documentation, making sure that we have really dotted all of those I's and crossed all of those T's to make sure that we have done everything we potentially can for this patient. Um, also looking at uh, the, the team and looking at the team to provide strength uh, to, to kind of case consult and look and see where did we, did we make a mistake? Did we make an error? We should go over this and make sure that everything is in order. No one likes to be um, threatened with media coverage and um, the potential for this to really happen is, is there. And so um, 
I think it, it causes us all as professionals to just pause and um, take a look and make sure that we did everything that we possibly could. Um, and I think the, the, probably the most um, important aspect of all of this is to con continue to um, abide and respect this gentleman's wishes um, and continue to advocate for his care under hospice. Okay, so on the surface of it, our case uh, had to do with issues of autonomy, uh, some specific issues about artificial nutrition and hydration, about uh, persons who have or don't have standing to interpose themselves into some end-of-life decisions. Um, and, and so if, uh, I mean, as we're looking around, we see the, the wheels are turning for some of you. Uh, and, and I'm sure that folks may have some uh, either comments uh, or questions that they'd like to share. So this would be that time. Don't be nervous. I very recently had this happen, and I'm a clinical social worker, retired, um, but I very recently experienced this very thing, nutrition and hydration, and someone, um, church organist for that matter, his mother had a very severe stroke. I worked with stroke patients 32 years at Mary Freebed. Um, a feeding tube until you could learn to swallow again was, was excellent treatment. Some people did try to get away from that, but still. Um, if it looked like they were going to be able to stay alive and continue to live, they could have been in their 40s or 50s, and they often did stay alive and live. On the other hand, this um, young man knew nothing about stroke, knew nothing about anything. So I, I, you know, I talked to him about stroke recovery and that sort of thing. And he said, well, my father doesn't, can't stand seeing his wife like this. She was, I think, fairly severely affected. I didn't know her or see her. And then he came back and said the family had decided because her wishes were that she not be artificially kept alive that they would stop food and drink. And at times she was not even very cognizant of what was going on. That night I started thinking, who's gonna tell her? <laughs> What's gonna happen if she just stops eating and drinking? And you answered some of the question about the nutrition. Can you address a little more the hydration and what happens when you stop hydration? Um, and how the body responds to that and how the comfort level of the patient gets addressed with that. Thanks. So with the, um, the request to medically clarify artificial nutrition and hydration, particularly the hydration piece and, and what, uh, what's the real scoop on that, um, again, I think it's important for us to make a distinction between persons who are dying and persons who are not dying. And in that latter category are patients who are uh, in the, the middle of an acute illness, a sudden illness or injury. I mean, persons after a car accident where they have, maybe have multiple fractures and are all full of tubes and wires, uh, clearly they can't eat in the normal way but we don't consider those patients automatically to be dying. In that situation, common sense tells us to buy some time for them by providing nutrition and hydration as their body heals from their injuries because we foresee a future time when they will again be able to take normal nutrition and normal fluids. And so of course, feeding tubes and IVs are appropriate in a situation like that. It's a little trickier with patients in a coma, for example, after a stroke or a, a poisoning or, or some other uh, type of injury, or persons who are, for whatever reason, in a persistent vegetative state. That, that's, 
very precise language when doctors and nurses use it. And uh, it has a neurological definition, persistent vegetative state. Some of the confusion and acrimony that came from cases like Cruzan and Shivo that many of you have heard about and are familiar with were around this issue of a persistent vegetative state and a coma and, and what does it mean to be aware or awake and how does that have uh, an effect on prognosis or life expectancy. So when we're talking about hospice, palliative care, end of life care, among our first assessments needs to be, are these people actually dying? Is their death foreseeable? Are they at the end of an advanced illness where it is likely, if the illness runs its expected course, that they're going to succumb? And if they are a dying person, then our approach to the hydration and nutrition is very different than somebody who may live, as you suggested in your, in your story, months, years. Uh, in a coma, in a vegetative state, or some diminished consciousness. That, that's a very important distinction. The other aspect of, of your question, I think, had to do with the, the subjective nature of suffering when someone is no longer eating or taking fluids. And most of us tend to reflect on our own experiences when we went without drinking. In summertime, hot environment, visiting the desert, whenever it was, we were really thirsty and had no immediate access to water. And that's a very, very uncomfortable feeling. And how horrible to think that someone's laying in a bed with that feeling times 10 and can't communicate it. That's why it bothers us. But we know from research and from people who have been in that situation who then woke up and were able to communicate their experience to us that persons, as I suggested earlier in my comments, persons who are gravely ill don't feel things subjectively in the same way. They may not feel hunger in the way that you and I feel hunger when we stop eating for a time. They may not feel thirst in the way that we feel thirst. And so, to the best that we can ascertain, dying persons uh, do not suffer the ravages of thirst and of a lack of food in the same way that healthy people denied those food and fluids would feel. And so frequently in counseling families, we, we try to get them over that hump. This is not the same as when you are fasting uh, or the same as when you are denied water. This is a totally different subjective experience for the ill person. and and. That's not to say that we wouldn't use artificial uh, hydration if the dehydration were causing a delirium type syndrome that was very uncomfortable and constituted suffering for the person, then it's easy to reverse that. And we do in hospice and palliative medicine use IV fluids, but we use them to diminish the suffering of a delirious person, not to extend their lives or try to get one more day out of them or for some other purpose. So I hope I've answered your, your question. Uh, all right, any other uh, questions or issues on case one? We'll move on with case two. All right, this is uh, case two and uh, this is, uh, I'll preface this by saying this is also uh, based on my own personal experience, uh, and so uh, I'll do my best to, to talk through this. Um, in 2007, my wife and I were expecting, and about 21 weeks along, uh, she went into preterm labor uh, and her water broke. Although doctors attempted to slow her contractions, uh, she delivered the baby at uh, 22 weeks and five days. I think I'm getting that right. Um, doctors advised us in that context uh, that uh, babies are not generally considered viable until 24 weeks. Uh, that, was, that was their uh, medical advice. Uh, but they did give us a choice. They said, 
either you can, uh, we'll try, we'll take the baby uh, to the NICU, uh, even though uh, the ventilator and the other equipment there uh, uh, are not small enough for uh, a baby delivered at, at this age, at this size. So they said, we can try, but in essence, that even uh, any kind of intervention in that way uh, will uh, most likely uh, be futile. So you can do that, but that's going to mean, of course, taking, uh, taking the baby with us. Uh, whatever short time uh, the baby has will be spent probably trying to resuscitate the baby rather than with you uh, and the family. Uh, and so uh, in that context, uh, although my wife was uh, fairly near to delivery, uh, there, there was some interaction with other family members urging us to uh, at least think about trying to relocate to another hospital uh, to try to get a, a second opinion or, or you know, maybe somebody else can do something, right? That's sometimes the feeling in that situation. There, there's there's got to be something we can do. Uh, and uh, instead, a after uh, considering it, um, praying about it, uh, my wife and I elected to stay at the hospital uh, to deliver our baby and to spend what time we could uh, with him uh, uh, before he died. Uh, so that's, that's a little bit of the background. That, that's my personal story. And so uh, I don't necessarily come at this as a medical expert, but that, that, that was my experience. Uh, as I reflect on that experience, um, a few considerations um, do stand out to me. Uh, the first thing is simply to uh, that I needed to listen to the medical professionals. They're the ones who know. Um, if I can't trust my doctor with this, uh, then, I'm, then, then what am I doing, right? I, I trust my doctor. Uh, they are the experts uh, on this issue. Uh, and so for me to uh, somehow assume that I have some kind of greater insight uh, into the medical nature of the case, uh, I think would, would, be, a, would be a problem. Uh, there's even a good Kuyperian theological phrase for this, and that is sphere sovereignty, uh, right? That there, there's a reason that there are different authorities in different fields and disciplines, and the point is listen to them. Uh, I might be a Bible professor, but I have no idea uh, when I go to the doctor what they're going to tell me. That, that's, their, that's their realm of expertise. Uh, and as we approach this situation, uh, I am much more well-versed at this point in my life on these fine medical distinctions uh, and ethical distinctions than I was at that point. Uh, in many ways, we were uh, just trying to figure out on the fly, what, uh, what do we do? What do we do in this situation? Um, and one thing that I think it's important, especially as, as Christians, to think about, sometimes uh, as we approach medical issues like this, um, we almost have an idea of an interventionist God, right? Like, let's keep somebody alive because then maybe God's going to step in and do something. Well, certainly we believe God can do that, but it can almost be, you know, God is absent when we get the diagnosis of terminal illness. God is absent when you know, the highway, highway wreck happens and somebody's in the hospital. Uh, if we believe that God is with us all the time, uh, then we have to recognize that it, it may be the case uh, that I am about to undergo suffering and there is no way to avoid that. Uh, we want to get out of, uh, oftentimes we want to get out of suffering. Uh, and so I think we have to be careful uh, so that we don't set up almost two gods. You know, the, 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 the happy God who bestows life and cheery, happy Sunday mornings, and then the God of diagnoses of cancer, right? And act as though God is somehow not also Lord in the midst of suffering and in the midst of, of death. Uh, that, that needs to be there as well. Uh, I think there's a good argument uh, that in our culture, maybe we should um, have our, at least for those of us in the Christian community, uh, bring our graveyards back to the church property. I don't know how that, exactly how that would look, but we can't we can't divorce, we can't separate those things, and I think there's a danger, um, the danger if we do. Uh, so we have to be careful about that. Uh, the other thing, uh, or another thing that I think about uh, theologically, uh, what I see in Scripture is, uh, especially in Scriptures like Philippians 2, 5 through 11, uh, 
uh, it talks about Jesus uh, as letting go uh, of his equality with God, his godlikeness. He, he was willing to humble himself to let go of all the rights and privileges he had, uh, even to the point of death. But it's instructive, I think, that in his death, uh, one of the things that Jesus says on the cross is, Father, I commit my hands into your spirit. Uh, Jesus was willing to let go, uh, even of his own life. Uh, but what he held on to uh, was faith and trust in his Father's goodness, even as he uh, underwent an extremely painful, excruciating death. Uh, in contrast, uh, I think what you see in the biblical story uh, of Adam and Eve is this desire to hold on to their own life. Right? In many ways, they let go of their faith and trust in God. We have to be in control of our own destiny. And in that attempt to hold on to their own life, uh, they ended up losing what was truly important. Uh, and so I think that as, as we think about that distinction, uh, all of us are faced, not, not just at uh, certain points uh, in, um, you know, we get to extreme medical situations, but all of us are faced daily uh, with the question of whether we are going to be conformed to Christ or to Adam. So do we hold on uh, to Christ? Do we hold on uh, to the hope that's there, even when we're let going, letting go of our own life? Uh, or do we hold on to our own life? And what happens uh, at the point of death, whether for ourselves or for our loved ones, is in many ways going to be a reflection of the long-term choices that, that we're making daily in thinking about that dynamic of, of holding on uh, and letting go. Uh, one final thing that I want to mention, uh, in, in, that, in the context that we experienced uh, as we... Um, uh, experience that very short time that we had with Stephen. Uh, our pastor uh, very helpfully emphasized that God is with us in and through this. Uh, that God, again, is not simply absent or that the only way that God might show up is to deliver you from this. That the way that God is with you through this might be in going through this suffering with you. Uh, and that, uh, I think, was uh, incredibly encouraging both to my wife and to myself and gave us the strength, I think, that we needed uh, to let go uh, in, that, in that circumstance. Uh, it was also, uh, I think we were greatly blessed uh, with amazing nurses uh, and amazing staff uh, who treated us and who treated our son as persons. Uh, they did not just treat us uh, as though we had medical uh, needs, but they treated us as whole persons. Uh, and I think that uh, was an amazing experience. And so the very short time that we had uh, with Stephen, both the day he was born and then the day after, uh, I think will we'll endure with us in part because of the way that those nurses were very much ministers uh, of God to us. And that uh, makes me think about if we view our professions, whether as, as ministers or medical professionals or social workers, if our profession is centered on the question, what can we do? Uh, then dying is going to be the fatal blow to our professional self-esteem. Because there's nothing you can do. Uh, there's nothing you can do uh, in terms of curing this, solving this. Um, but I think what's important to remember is that we don't, in many ways, we don't have something to give to the dying. Christ already is the decisive gift between the living and the dying. And that our call is simply to uh, be the presence of, of Christ. Now, we don't have to produce God's love in those situations, but rather we simply have to bring forth signs of that, whether it's something as simple as sitting with someone, uh, a brief prayer, uh, a word that, that doesn't try to solve the problem because you can't solve the problem. Uh, but how are you, in essence, uh, being with someone uh, as they walk through that? And uh, it, it's uh, it been amazing, again, to reflect on my own experience and think about how uh, God used uh, the, especially the nurses that we encountered there uh, to minister to us in, in that situation. So those are just a few of my reflections and, and thoughts on my own experience. Uh, so I'll turn it over to my colleagues at this point. In my 25 years of doing this kind of work, 
There were two instances where I thought I was this close to getting punched in the nose. And this case has both elements to it. The, the first is what I'll, I'll lay the, uh, the background of what we sometimes call the tyranny of technology. And the fact that just because we can do something technologically, does that mean that we must do it uh, in the case of a, of a serious need? Or even that we should do it ethically? Now, in the story, we didn't hear that there were others criticizing uh, the decision that was made, but if the extended family is like most, somebody somewhere uh, was saying, I can't believe they're not going to take this child to the Mayo Clinic, to U of M, to do something. Um, and that, uh, that can be a very heartfelt expression of grief, uh, but it can also be part of this being ensnared in that tyranny of technology, having some notion that they've got all kind of treatments and miracle drugs and surgeries and supportive care and why aren't they bringing all of these weapons to bear into this situation? And to not do that is somehow a failing. And, and it, people who even, even given an explanation or given a rational uh, approach to the care that continue to insist that everything that's out there needs to be applied uh, brings me to the nose punching part because on, in, in one such case I said I suppose somewhat indelicately to a, a family member you know what I think we've crossed over from talking about what's best for this patient now we're dealing with what's best for you because the demand for the intervention, the wanting to do everything at all costs was not going to do the patient any good. The real benefit and the need there was uh, in the person doing the demanding and I'm sure the social work has a, a perspective on that. So that was one time I thought I was going to get one right in the, in the nose. The second time was a, a very spiritual, very religious, because they're not always the same thing very spiritual, very religious family who said to me, I was the hospice doctor on the case, doctor, we want you to keep mother alive longer because we're praying for a miracle. Which on the face of it was not an, uh, an outrageous statement. But again, in my naivete, I said, don't you think that if God intends a miracle for mom, he can kind of do that on his own. He doesn't need me to do anything, whether it's keep her around another day or anything else. I'm not strong enough to subvert his will if a miracle is in the plans. So that was the second time I thought I was going to get it. <laughs> but I don't know if, if you want to comment on my, <laughs> my uh, attitude in, in that situation and whether... Uh, maybe more diplomatically stated would have been helpful. Uh, well, that, that's okay. I'm not always one for stating things diplomatically. Uh, so <laughs> sometimes you just have to say it like it is. But, but I think that that does speak again to the mindset that uh, God is sort of absent in terms of the natural everyday occurrences uh, and that if only we step in to sort of help him out by keeping somebody alive longer for a couple days, uh, then he'll have the chance uh, to step in. So we have to be very careful, I think, when we, um, when we approach it that way. And I do think, I, I love that statement, the tyranny of, of technology, uh, just because I think it reflects even more broadly how our culture uh, thinks about life and technology in general and the way that we, we do long to control everything. Uh, and that this is just w one area, especially where it comes to the surface. Yeah, so, uh, students, Tyranny of technology and sphere sovereignty are both on the test, so. <laughs> well, um, I was reviewing some of the um, uh, NASW standards of um, practicing in hospice and palliative care, and I, I guess I needed a little bit of a pick-me-up. I've 
been around for a while, and I, I love this statement that I, I read, and I'm just going to read it to you. It says that um, palliative care and hospice offer social workers the privilege of supporting individuals and families during some of the most universal and vulnerable life experiences. Coping with serious illness, facing one's mortality, the dying process, and bereavement. Hospice and palliative care social workers witness on a daily basis the struggle to find meaning in the face of serious illness and death. They also have a unique opportunity to help people identify, try to answer, and live with core existential questions. Social workers may also enjoy the positive regard with which palliative care and hospice are perceived by many individuals, families, and other service providers. Wow, I, I looked at that and I thought, that is certainly the backbone of, of what we do. And and then I'm thinking about this, this case, and, and I'm, I'm just, I, I first have to say I'm really sorry that that was your experience, that that's, uh, that's something that you had to do um, and you had to go through. Um, not an easy time. Brought me back to my days as an early social worker in, um, as an OB social worker, and often it wasn't all, um, glorious. The only time they ever called us in was when there was a situation like yours. The, the thing I immediately um, think about is what I usually did for myself, for my self-preservation before walking into a case like this. And, and that is, as I'm, um, I'm getting the sort of statistics about what's happening and what's unfolding, and I'm thinking about this family before I even meet them. And I'm thinking about what this day must be like for them. I'm really trying to establish a, a, a point of presence with them before I get there. So I'm, I, I, um, I am a woman of faith, and um, so I will oftentimes pray before I get there um, for many things. First of all, that I don't stumble over my words, that I don't say the wrong things, and that I actually am able to practice the gift of presence and compassion with his family. I also think about um, the, the one thing um, that really every social worker needs to, to really um, look at is their own self-awareness. Before we can even um, help others, we have to sort of put our own oxygen mask on first and those of you that have been my interns know that I will tell you that before we even go out into the field that know yourself know your um, what's going on with you and take care of yourself first before you try and take care of others so that would be something that I, I, I obviously see that the nurses did before they came in and gave you such wonderful compassionate care social workers um, that work in end-of-life care, um, because of the amount of compassion and sensitivity that we um, impart and we um, respect patients' rights to self-determination, we really have to be aware of our own belief system, our own values, our own feelings, monitor them, and make sure that this is not becoming something about us and it is focusing on um, the, the family. The other thing I, I looked at, and I just, I read this on my, um, the other day, and I read it again this morning, and I looked at the fact that, uh, there's a statement, um, the extended family urged the parents to try to relocate to another hospital in hopes of getting a second opinion. When I think about that, I think about that, um, oftentimes in my job, I see people after the death, and during the period of bereavement, I always find that individuals question whether they did enough. And that, that guilt and shame that they never really did enough, where they didn't do it quite right, often will come from the naysayers in the crowd. I know that people are often very well intended, but 
when these types of things happen or when there's a, a questioning of a second opinion, it can also lead to some tremendous amounts of guilt and suffering, emotional suffering in the end um, down the road. So I, I just um, like to use that as a word of caution when you're supporting family members or you're a social worker, that that is sort of um, an elephant in the room that a social worker really does need to address. So, um, thank you. Uh, I just want to uh, make one other remark. Uh, it was, you know, in going through uh, that situation, uh, it was helpful because uh, I felt like as we, as we did talk with our family about this, uh, there was, when it was a recognition that this, this is what's going to happen, um, there, we did feel uh, support uh, and care. And so as we look back, uh, you know, we have, uh, it was an extremely sad day, but we do also have all these pictures of us uh, with my siblings and uh, mom and my wife's siblings and parents. And uh, there was also joy that was there. I mean, there was, uh, even though it's, uh, there, there's, you can have both extremes at the same time. Uh, and so again, I'm very, uh, I'm thankful for uh, just the strength to, to go through that. So, in case two, we covered a lot of territory. We talked about the sanctity of family decision making in the face of an overwhelming situation. We've talked about technology and treatment and whether we can do something and whether we should do something. We talked about the power of the ministry of presence and the ministry of compassion. So. This is the audience participation part, where if you have comments or questions uh, that you'd like to share with the group, now's your opportunity. Sir, you've got the floor. Maybe just tell us your first name, uh, and then go ahead with your comment or your question. My name is uh, Ken, uh, uh, pastor, oh, and, and I graduated from Reformed Bible College, by the way, oh. before it was here. It was over in the lake. And uh, I've gone with many families and many situations with people through these things end-of-life situations and, and encouraged, even with my own parents, hospice care, and, and et cetera. But I want us to remember that doctors aren't God. Just because that's what they think <laughs> doesn't mean that's absolutely the case. My own doctor, who is an internist and brilliant, and he's a Christian, and we pray together, etc. And uh, I've had several illnesses, bypass surgery, etc. Um, he says to me, he said to me one time, he says, "Well, he says we think we know so much, but he said we only know a little, just a little bit, about how the human body works and functions." And I want to go back now to a, a story of a. 55-year-old pastor who had a brain aneurysm and they had to do surgery and he would not come out of his coma and they went on week after week after week after week they couldn't figure out what it was and all of a sudden somebody said you know what he's a diabetic and we've been giving him medication like he was an active person. We should change his medication, his diabetic medication. And within a day, and after they changed his medicine, he, he was alive and he could talk to us and he could respond to us and, and, and actually did pretty well. So I just uh, want us to be uh, aware that as we talk about these end of life things, uh, it's important uh, for us to understand 
and, and, uh, but to also remember that doctors are humans and the nurses that work with them are humans, okay? All right, thank you. All right, thanks for your comment. I think it, it does illustrate the benefit of having not just physicians, but also uh, nurses, social workers, spiritual care and grief support folks, uh, volunteers, bedside aides, and all others who are specialists in this type of care, who are a little more experienced, a little more savvy, and who have become humbled, not only by their own mistakes and the mistakes of others, but also by the enormity of what they're trying to do, is to provide families and dying persons with a, a sacred space, a, a cocoon of safety around that, those final hours and final days so that the, the very necessary work at the end of life can take place and the suffering is diminished. And I think the people who do that work on a regular basis are very humbled by it and are less likely to have the, uh, the, the, the attitude that, that you imply or, or to make the kind of mistakes that might be made assuming that we know more than we know. Well, I was just going to say, uh, I think it's certainly a problem if doctors uh, think they're God. Uh, it's equally a problem when patients want their doctors to be God uh, as well, which I presume is part of why there are you know, so many malpractice suits is because we're dealing with actual human beings uh, and, and not with God. Certainly there are uh, errors, but I think that as, as patients that's something to consider as well. I love the logic of a philosophy professor. <laughs> Um, I'm going to read the last, um, the last case study, and um, we'll open that up for discussion as well. Um, this woman is a 37-year-old female with metastatic cervical cancer. She self-identifies herself as a woman of faith and a lifelong member of the Christian Reformed Church. She's been married for 16 years, and they have four children in the home a 17-year-old son who is the patient's child from a previous relationship, a 13-year-old daughter, a 7-year-old daughter, and a 4-year-old son. Patient has a close relationship with her mother who is helpful and supportive. Her father is deceased. She has two siblings, both brothers, who reside out of state. The husband a teacher by profession, has a history of alcoholism and bipolar disorder that is well managed. Artificial nutrition that was started in the hospital prior to going home on hospice care represented hope to the patient's family due to their perception the patient was starving to death versus dying from metastatic disease. The patient, a nurse, expressed desire to, quote, go home, end quote, while hospitalized. And when hospice was suggested, she signed on without her family's support. The family expressed concern that she was, quote, giving up and wanted her to, quote, fight the disease. Anger, emotional outbursts, regression, and acting out were observed among the children as a means of coping and family seemingly lost hope. The spouse maintained his control and adversity to substances by conservatively distributing her pain medication, acknowledging that he wanted the patient to be alert and conversant, knowing that the morphine and other medications caused excessive sedation, and a rapid death. Family would not allow prior discussions about life after patient's death and normalization of feelings, concerns, modeling a proper goodbye, and reconciliation attempts were impacted significantly. Um, not a real case, but um, certainly one that um, is one that I know well from my 
my own background in social work as well as my colleagues. The first element of, of social work practice, of course, is um, patient self-determination. She willingly made the decision to sign herself on to hospice after careful consideration and, I would assume, dialogue with the hospice personnel in the hospital. She went home and actually made mention of, quote, going home several times in the hospital. And I am always alert to this type of metaphor that is contained in language because for many of us, especially us that work in hospice care, know that going home does not always necessarily mean I want to go home to that four walls in that place on Main Street. It can mean something a little bit different. The thing that I, um, I looked at as well is the, um, the ability for the team to really get in there and work together. The chaplain, a volunteer, the social worker, the physician, these are often the cases that have um, and benefit from case consultation and a, a family conference, especially when there is that many developmental stages and anticipatory grief that is in that uh, family system. The um, children were all uh, experiencing a lot of anticipatory grief symptoms that we often see, the regressive behavior, the acting out, and they're doing it on their developmental level. And children, we all know, don't uh, just lay down on a couch and talk to a therapist. They usually will do their grief work, their anticipatory grief work through behavior. And we are often the recipients of that. It is often common, I see, that families sort of misperceive getting better with um, the use of artificial hydration. They also, from their own perspective, of course this gentleman doesn't want his wife to die. She's 37 years old and he's going to have four children under the age of 17 alone. And so he does want her to fight. And this is an area where your, your best, best social workers, chaplains, physicians, are really gonna need to do a lot of work, countless hours of intervention with this family and allowing them to, to do this their own way and on their own terms. We often see people conservatively managing medication because they don't want to um, put someone in a stupor, a med medical stupor, so to speak. I think most importantly, what I, I also see is just the loss of hope and how that translates into this family and what happens, that loss of hope. The, also, the other element is some disenfranchised grief. We all know that when um, a young person dies, we look at a primary bereaved. We think, oh, do they have children? Do they have a husband? And oftentimes the parents that are in their 50s and 60s um, are often forgotten. And we, um, to coin a phrase by Ken Doka, it is a um, disenfranchised grief. And it's one that is very difficult and one that is not often addressed. So um, I, I see a lot of areas where um, the team could intervene with his family to allow them to say goodbye, to allow them to understand what is going on with the children and um, allow some good conversation so that the husband will be able to medicate his wife uh, appropriately and accordingly and so that she does not um, have periods of time where she is uh, obviously suffering. So I'm going to 
Uh, a few, just a few remarks uh, about this case. It, it does make me think, uh, as I think about this, uh, whether uh, theologically or pastorally, it does highlight the need um, to recognize that often uh, one of the biggest needs that surfaces at a, at a time of death is reconciliation, that oftentimes uh, certain things may come to the surface in terms of uh, family life, certain fractures uh, are going to be highlighted, especially when you lose somebody uh, who uh, serves as uh, the glue uh, within uh, a family, whether that's within an individual family unit or within a broader extended family. Uh, and so uh, if you think about the problem long term, this is part of why there needs to be, uh, I think, continual work at uh, reconciliation uh, and conflict management before uh, you get to a crisis point uh, in the life uh, of a family. Um, one of the interesting things, yeah, I, I, again, I totally understand why in this situation a husband uh, would want his wife to fight the disease. Uh, but I do think it's interesting to think about the metaphor, uh, the, the battle metaphors that we often use, uh, you know, the war on cancer. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to win. Uh, and so I'm not sure if setting it up in, in, in use of a battle metaphor uh, is the most helpful way to approach that. Uh, it, it also makes me think, uh, it, in the way that Scripture talks about uh, your enemies, specifically, okay, 1 Corinthians 15 says, death is the last enemy to be defeated. Uh, what does Jesus say about your enemies? Well, love your enemies. Uh, now, that, that, now, I don't think that means we say death is somehow good in and of itself. Uh, but death can be an occasion where we find out the truth that, as Paul says, neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor the present nor the future nor any powers nor height or depth or anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, there is something about walking through the experience of death and recognizing, as Song of Song says uh, in 8 verse 6, love is as strong as death. Uh, that's something that we can find uh, only in that. And so when we, when, uh, from a Christian perspective, when we think about death, Paul does say in Romans 8, we are more than conquerors. But it's important to recognize how we are conquerors. Uh, it's because we are conformed to Christ's death in our living and dying. It's not because we escape uh, death. And so we are not, we, you know, we have to remember, even as we think about the death of Christ, uh, we're not called to save Christ from his death. We're called to follow him in that. Uh, and so we can follow uh, Christ through the paths of the dead because uh, he's already emerged triumphant, holding the keys of death in Hades. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, I think we can... Uh, give up the battle, realizing that Christ ultimately is the victor, uh, and that we might suffer uh, the temporary defeat. We, we may, in fact, we will, in fact, go the way of all flesh. Uh, but we can either do that in a way that's conformed to Christ, or, again, going back to my earlier remarks, uh, in a way that is conformed to Adam, uh, where we are kicking and screaming, doing everything possible uh, to hang on there. Uh, in other words, we can let go uh, in confidence that he's holding on to us uh, in the midst of that and, and uh, that we trust that he is holding on to us, uh, body and soul and life and death, right, that, that we belong uh, to him. And I think that gives us the ability then uh, not to say, well, there are never circumstances where we should fight. Uh, certainly there are. But to recognize that that metaphor may at certain points let us down or, we, or that we need to rethink uh, how that might shape our thinking around what we're doing. Uh, that, uh, to recognize that the, the Christ, as the true master of death, is the master of death precisely because he accepted it, uh, not because he found a way to avoid it or to go around it. Uh, so that's uh, comments of a more theological nature, but I think those, those metaphors are worth thinking through. Life is terminal. No one gets out alive. <laughs> you know, this patient was younger than many that we care for in hospice and palliative care. And of course, the, the youth of the dying person plus her children makes it a particularly poignant 
and, and kind of a heart-wrenching story. But even at this age, um, some of the conflict between the lines is because of very different ideas about end-of-life approach and health care and medical care between the husband and the patient, which is an argument that we in palliative care and hospice like to make every time we have the opportunity for advanced directives. So let me just say a few things about advanced directives, even though it wasn't uh, part of the case. I always get people's attention uh, in these discussions when I invoke the name of the late Dr. Kevorkian. Now, why would a hospice guy be talking about Jack Kevorkian? Because legally, ethically, morally, I cannot endorse his approach to patient care in any way. But as a society, we do owe a, a very limited debt to Dr. Kevorkian because during those days uh, in the 80s and 90s when he was doing his thing and his exploits were in the media, in the newspapers, and on TV, all of a sudden a very taboo subject became okay to discuss among family members. People who never would have considered any discussing with their family members any issues about medical care or end of life choices, it was all of a sudden okay to sit around the kitchen table and start talking about this crazy Kevorkian cat, but then moving on to, well, if that ever happened to me, Here's what I would want. And remember, that for generations was a taboo subject. Even as medical science advanced, because in the old days it didn't matter. Doctors couldn't do anything, whether they thought they were God or not. They didn't really have a lot to offer. But, you know, as, as we moved on in the sophistication of our approach and we were able to actually make a difference for people, uh, then this idea that, that death was optional uh, came in people's minds, uh, and that th this idea that you know we should be doing everything, um, and that we should expect that everything be done on our behalf, and that we would survive no matter what happens to us, you know, those all became part of of the uh, the national discussion. But the idea that well, there might be somebody who doesn't get better, there might be somebody for whom the surgical techniques and the miracle drugs don't work, which by the way is a hundred percent of human beings. Um, we have to have a, a way of thinking about that and a way of talking about that. Oh no, we, we weren't going to talk about that. But then along comes Kevorkian and makes those discussions okay. So now the families were having those conversations and people were talking about what they thought of breathing machines and artificial hydration, nutrition, IVs, feeding tubes, Miracle drugs, CPR, electric shocks, those became okay topics for people to discuss. Um, one patient, uh, or, or one, I should say one of my uh, mentors actually said, the problem always was, if it were the older adult who brought up the subject of end of life care, the children would be suspicious and say, well, what, what are they saying to us? Why is dad worrying about this? And if it were the adult children who were bringing up the topic, then dad was saying, well, what do they know that I don't know? Why do they want to talk about <laughs> funerals and feeding tubes? So there were barriers. Well, Kevorkian broke some of the barriers uh, for us in our modern society. And the advanced directives, whether that is in the, uh, in the form of a living will or some type of a legal document as part of a will and testament, or just a very simple statement uh, committed to paper letting your friends and your family and your loved ones know your attitudes about end-of-life care and what you want for yourself or don't want for yourself is a very powerful tool and it's a tremendous gift to give your loved ones so that they don't have to struggle with those types of questions what would dad want
What would mom say if she could wake up long enough to contribute to this conversation? What would she say about the breathing machine or about the CPR? We have the opportunity, even at 37 years old, to begin to have those conversations with our loved ones and our families and put those things down in writing. And it, it doesn't have to be a trip to a lawyer uh, that costs a lot of money. Uh, there are very simple ways. There are forms online that you can download and fill out that while they don't have the same, uh, perhaps the same strength in a, in a courtroom as a uh, contract, they are still very powerful documents and the courts in Michigan have been very, uh, very much inclined to go with the statements made in such a way. Uh, and so when people say, well, the living will is not le legal in Michigan, that's technically true. But advanced directives properly executed, the naming of someone as durable power of attorney so that this is my patient advocate. This is who I trust to understand my values and, and my life story. And if I can't speak for myself, they will make a judgment for me, and I'm okay with that. There are easy ways for us to document those attitudes and those beliefs. I know that Hospice of Michigan has a program they call Have You Had the Talk? And on their website and at their 800 number, it's an actual packet of material that has all of the forms and the instructions that people would need to try to demystify that process and make it easy for families to have that conversation and then get some things down on paper so that some day off in the far off future, something happens, my family knows exactly what it is that I want, they know my attitudes about life, about death, about spirituality, about what I want for myself. So let me, let me make a plug for advanced directives about having those difficult conversations and having them at a time when everyone is he healthy and happy and can be objective rather than waiting until a crisis occurs and people are on the phone at two o'clock in the morning trying to figure out what you want for yourself. Get up. <laughs> well, I know that there are some folks in the audience who have uh, worked in health care, worked in hospice care. Um, we're back to an audience participation point in the presentation. And so uh, if you have questions or comments or Reflections on these topics, uh, please share them with us. Again, your, your first name and then uh, share your question or comment. My name is Trish and um, I am a Christian. I'm an RN and I've worked in the uh, geriatric population, multiple other places, but that for uh, most of my working career. I did many um, workshops and private conversations with families on advanced directives and did a lot of teaching along that line, helping families to accept that probably over the last 20 years. And um, that had came a long way. And now personally, um, my father passed away seven years ago and my mother um, three years ago. And the difficulty that I had in the medical profession having advanced directives for both of them, having durable power of attorney myself, and it was like I needed a, new, a different language, especially for young physicians they would not accept uh, words that were on paper because they weren't specific enough or they were too vague. And hospice was not an accepted word for my mother. And um, I guess I, I would like what words are the right words then that would be heard and accepted? Eventually, 
it was, but it was agonizing weeks and days. And well, Trish, thank you for sharing that story with us. I'm sure that wasn't an easy, uh, easy thing to do. And of course, all of us hearing you tell that are uh, alternately uh, angry uh, and uh, perplexed. The thing that occurs to me right off the top is that I'll just deal with the physician piece. The, the doctors work for you. You don't work for the doctors. And if you had a, a very clear statement of your mom's wishes and you were a proper durable power of attorney and the doctors were resisting, the thing to do in that situation is to fire the doctor and get another one who is a little more savvy and understands not only the law, but understands their professional responsibility that will work with you on it. So that is of no comfort to you at this point. But a principle of management for the audience is that, that doctors do not have the authority to subvert people in their advanced directives or their choices of hospice. An individual doctor can say, I won't sign certification for hospice. I understand that doc, you're fired. You're my doctor and will you sign the certification for me? And that's what sometimes people have to do until the, the society and the medical legal environment and the physician mindset catches up with where many of us are going with autonomy and freedom of choice and the right to refuse treatment and the right to select hospice as, as an end of life choice. So it'll be some time until the rest of the world catches up. In the meantime, there's no reason why a, a person's choice shouldn't be honored. And if you have a hospital or a, a medical provider that won't play along, you can find another one who will. I'm sure you have a, a point of view on that. I'm just, um, I, I, I'm thinking about the language and I know that many of the, the forms for the advanced directives are, are, you know, now they're pretty specific and um, I know where we can come, sometimes get into a little bit of a sticky situation is when um, I've seen some people put their own word in there and they'll say, well, I don't want anything done if I'm brain dead or I don't want anything, I, I want you to put me on the ventilator for a little while and then take me off. I, I have seen those. And I think that um, if we get some clear direction and, and we meet with some, some individuals as we institute those or um, perhaps at the time of signing on to hospice, um, the social worker should probably ask, and you know, do you, have you done an advanced directive? Um, you can often, I always say, can I see it? And, and I go over it. And, and at that point in time, if the person is still you know, cognizant and you've got some of that really vague terminology in there, I might suggest, oh, I've got one in my bag here. How would you like to do another one and we can be a little bit more specific? I, and and that's, that's the only thing where I can see, otherwise I agree. I, I, I think that it, at that point in time, you know, the wishes are pretty well known. Um, I can't see appeasing a physician. I just find another one. So I'm sorry that that happened. Hi, I'm Adam, I'm a nurse. Um, I was curious how, uh, in your profession, how uh, you, each of you would respond to the, to the why question, uh, maybe coming from the family. Uh, like, for example, in this case scenario, like the 37-year-old woman with four children, um, if the children approach you and ask why this happened, and may even blame God, you know, why? Why did he let this happen? And I'm curious how you would answer that because that would be a question that would kind of frighten me. <laughs> I, I think for this venue, I, I would like to punt to the, that to the theological realm and uh, let you uh, 
as I would expect. That's why they pay me the big bucks. No, they don't. Uh, uh, it, it's a great question. Uh, if I could answer it in a way that would satisfy people completely, uh, they would be paying me the big bucks. Uh, but I think what, what we see, I, I think we have to be careful because sometimes um, we can act like, um, well, we can go to one of two extremes. Uh, I think we can just sit in despair uh, and we can say um, this situation is uh, truly hopeless, uh, that, that God is somehow not here or, not, or, or absent. Uh, he doesn't realize this is happening. Um, and to me, that's even more problematic than saying there is a good God who, for reasons that we can't explain, does allow suffering. Right? To me, that's more comforting than to say there is no God or God is somehow just completely absent, absent from this. Uh, but I think what you see, for example, in the book of Job uh, is that Job and his friends have this whole dialogue uh, about why is this happening? Uh, well, it must be because Job did something bad. And sometimes people will say, well, you know, Job answers the question of why human suffering. Uh, and usually I ask, have you ever actually read the book of Job? Uh, because uh, it, it does answer it, but not in the way that we often think of the answer. Uh, that Job and his friends are, are talking uh, and that uh, God then enters the conversation. Uh, and uh, part of what God does in it, what I think are some of the most amazing chapters of Scripture in Job 38 uh, on... Uh, is that God doesn't answer questions, he asks questions. Uh, just a litany of questions. You know, where were you when I made the earth? Where are you? you know, there are mountain goats giving birth that no human being will ever see. Where, where are you in that? Uh, and so it, it does answer it, but it answers it by, um, you could read that just as, as God just giving Job the smackdown. All right, who do you think you are? Uh, but God is present with Job uh, in the midst of the suffering uh, and that he doesn't attempt to say, let, let me explain it all, let me make sense of this, uh, but God is present there. And I think in many ways that is a, that is a uh, foreshadowing of what you ultimately see uh, on the cross, which is God is not absent from our suffering, but that God in fact bears our suffering with us uh, in the deepest way. Uh, and so... Um, so I think uh, typically in a situation like that, I don't try to give any answer, you know, let me say why. I, say, I, I don't know why this is happening, uh, but I know uh, that God is not absent, uh, that he is not far off, uh, just unaware, uh, right? That, you know, the song from a distance, God is watching. Uh, no, that, that's not the case. God is, God is present uh, in the midst of this, and God can uh, and does take what seems to be something horrible and use it for good. Now, that doesn't make it good. It doesn't make this specific thing good. But it means that this can be an occasion for God to somehow bring something good out of this. And I don't know what that is, uh, but that may even be, you are now someone who has walked through this path of suffering. Uh, others will walk that path in the future. How might God use you to minister to others? Because you know what it's like. You have been there. Right? And that's part of the point, again, when we think about Jesus, uh, the book of Hebrews, the whole point is Jesus has been there. Jesus knows uh, what it's like to suffer uh, and die. Uh, and so God himself knows what you're going through uh, in, from an experiential point of view, not just from being out there watching us, but internally God knows uh, what you're experiencing. So that would be my short answer. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't that short. <laughs> But it was a tough question, so. <laughs> Ma'am, sure. Let's take one more question. My name is Mary, and I've had over a quarter century as a nurse and the same amount of time as a pastor. And um, your case study and your case study rang a bell with me when I was working at American Oncologic Hospital in Philadelphia. I took care of a 37-year-old rabbi's wife who had five children. And since I worked the evening shift, I admired this woman over the top because she had five children. And in the evening, she would settle their arguments on the telephone, et cetera, et cetera. 
And then um, one night, uh, it was shortly before Christmas, the children were all there. They were piling on the bed. They were pestering her about this and that. And are you going to come home for Christmas? Are you going to come home for Christmas? And so I gave her my meds and chatted a little bit. But when I turned to walk out of the room, my eyes were filled with tears. And I'm sure that there were some running down my face. Her husband chased me out of the room. And, set, and about put me up against the wall and said, you blew it. You absolutely blew it. You blew it. And I said, I'm sorry. And he said, nurses are not supposed to cry. And so I was thinking of your case, and I was wondering if the nurses who loved you and sat with you, did they cry? And the whole business of our emotional self being involved in our care with the uh, patients that we love. So any comments would be appreciated. Thank you. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head. I'm looking at my wife. Uh, what I do remember uh, is that uh, I do remember them certainly participating even in the joy of this. Uh, and so they uh, ood and odd over our baby. Um, he's beautiful. Uh, they, they helped us dress him in, in tiny clothes and a tiny hat. Uh, and um, again, that, uh, to me, I think it, it's maybe the opposite end of the, of the spectrum, uh, but meant just as much. Uh, you know, they, they weren't tiptoeing around us and say, you know, just kind of leave him alone, just, just avoid this. Uh, and so they're uh, I think their participation in our joy uh, probably meant just as much as uh, uh, expressions of grief in that situation as well. But I think certainly uh, we felt that they were uh, engaged with us as whole persons, uh, that, that they brought uh, who they were to this. This wasn't just them uh, putting on a mask or a face to try to get through this. So that, that I think would be my... Yeah, I think that's something that medical professionals have to struggle with individually. You know, we're, we're taught to have this emotional distance or this, you know, objectivity so that you don't get all wrapped up in cases. But uh, as has been suggested, we are all human beings and all reflect unfortunate or catastrophic circumstances in the way that we would react if, if that were, you know, our own family or our, our own situation. And you, you can be detached and get a little crusty after a while, but, but you never co completely lose that connection, or at least I hope you don't. Um, I have had a number of occasions over the years where uh, a family or a patient that was very spiritual would say, uh, Doc, would you pray with us? And it makes me a little uncomfortable because my credentials are kind of thin in that area. <laughs> but what would the what would the alternative be say no i'm sorry that's not the appropriate role for the physician well of course not you know the appropriate is to you know clasp hands and close your eyes and and, and maintain a respectful presence while they prayed and and why not you know regardless of your faith tradition or theirs uh, that's not an inappropriate interaction to have and so uh, and actually i i took that as a tremendous compliment when that would occur that they trusted me enough to make that request so that's sometimes a gift that we get uh, in, in doing this work with patients and families, and um, it, it brings us back. I, um, I think that a, a lot of times that is the old, the old school um, way of thought, and I, I can tell you that we have a lot of debates um, in my hospice where I work about this. You know, do we show emotion? Do we cry? I mean. Seriously, some of these cases just rip at your heart. The other thing that they also do is they also appeal to our own vulnerabilities. And one of the, the areas that I, I see a growing trend in is, is the awareness of compassion fatigue, um, that high cost of caring that we as healthcare providers um, it kind of takes its toll on us. And, and that's why there's so much emphasis on self-care, self-awareness for, for all of us as we continue to go out and do this work daily. I personally and professionally 
think that um, when I see a tear or when I shed one that I'm, I'm really emotionally and physically and spiritually present with that person. I recently um, had a, my own hospice experience. I, um, uh, my mother died um, just a few months ago and I happened to use the hospice that I work for, um, Spectrum Health, and I um, I had her in the hospital for just a few days before she passed away, and she never would have wanted hospice. It was fine that I worked there, but um, she was not going to use it. She's a very strict, staunch Dutch lady, and um, I remember being so comforted. I was I was with her overnight, and um, the hospice physician came in, and boy, I saw her in a clearly different light. I mean, she was my colleague and person I see at the office every day and she looked across the bed at me and and you know my mother's 94 had a great life and she had tears in her eyes and um and i knew at that moment that boy she was really with me and um i would i i so appreciated that so i i just i can't say that it, it, are wrong or um, I think that when we use ourselves as a tool for what we do um, they're gonna come whether um, we like it or not so. well I think we're getting the hook on the uh, program so um, you know again uh, I'd like to thank Kuiper College and Spectrum Health and Hospice of Michigan for sponsoring the event and allowing us to uh, share some time with you talking about these issues. And I'll bet you have a wrap up that you'd like to do. Thank you all for coming today. And let's give the panel a hand. I just want to remind you that on the back table there are some handouts from hospice. I know that some of you grabbed a uh, resource manual that our librarians at Kuiper College put together and they ran out of those but we have a newly refreshed pile so you can um, take one of those. Any handouts? Also, if you came and you're a social worker, you'll need to sign out again and the students will have a certificate. And thank you all for coming.